Hello, everyone, and welcome to Untold Stories of the West, which features four authors whose work gives us new insight into who really lives in the American West and what their stories are. I'm Jennifer Widman of the South Dakota Center for the Book. The State Center is an affiliate of the Library of Congress Center for the Book in Washington, DC. Our mission is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy with a special emphasis on promoting the unique literary heritage of each state or territory. The authors in this video are from the Western Two region of the United States. Their books were chosen by the affiliated centers for the book from their states to represent their state's literary heritage. These so-called great reads from great places are chosen every year by the affiliate centers. And you can see the entire list from this year and preceding years at www.read.gov slash great reads. The authors participating today are Kali Fajardo Anstein, author of Woman of Light, representing Colorado. Sarah Vogel, author of The Farmer's Lawyer, representing North Dakota. Nick Estes, author of Our History is the Future, representing South Dakota. And Jonathan Bailey, author of When I Was Red Clay, representing Utah. These authors are here with us to discuss their work, and they will also address the theme of this year's National Book Festival, Books Bring Us Together. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation and consider listening to all the authors in these Great Reads videos. Together, they are a testament to the richness and diversity of this nation's literary creativity. So thank you all for being with us. I am going to start by having each of our four authors introduce themselves very briefly, kind of your elevator pitch, and just give us a two or three sentence summary of the book that's being featured here today. And I know that's a tall order in many ways, um, but just to kind of give us an idea of who you are and what your, your featured book is about. And Kali, I believe I'm going to go in uh, alphabetical order by states right now. So Kali, I'll start with you. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. Um, well, I'm excited to be here. Thank you to my fellow panelists. My name is Kali Fajardo Anstein, and I am the author of Sabrina and Karina, the short story collection that was published in 2019. It was nominated for the National Book Award and won an American Book Award. And I am here to discuss my debut novel, Woman of Light. And Woman of Light is an intergenerational story that spans 1868 to 1934 and what we now call Colorado. And it's based on the oral tradition of my own ancestors in Denver. Thank you, Kali. And then we'll move along to North Dakota represented by Sarah Vogel. So Sarah, you can unmute yourself and share. Hi, everybody, and thank you very much, Jennifer, and I'm thank grateful to be nominated for this. My book is called The Farmer's Lawyer, and it's about a case that I brought in the 1980s that started with just a handful of farmers who were facing foreclosure and basically being starved off their farms by the federal government, and it ended with a national class action covering 245,000 farmers and saved tens of thousands from foreclosure. And it was my first case. And this is uh, the book about my clients who are, I call, they became called the North Dakota Nine. And um, the law, a lot of history uh, of North Dakota, North Dakota's nonpartisan league. And it's a, I, I like to think of it as a true legal thriller. It even has an endorsement by John Grisham. <laughs> yes, indeed. In fact, it also has an endorsement, if I remember correctly, by Willie Nelson. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, so that's quite a broad range of, of endorsements for a book. So, yes. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And then Nick, we'll, we'll turn to you, Nick from South Dakota. My name is Nick Estes, and I am an enrolled member of the Lower Rural Sioux Tribe, and I'm talking today about my book, Our History is the Future, um, which won a Penn Oakland Award, um, and, you know, very grateful to have received this recognition uh, for this book, um, part of the Oak Lake Writers Society, and I believe a lot of my work uh, is influenced and derivative from the long traditions of uh, oral histories um, from the Ocheti Shakoni, the Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota people, um, as well as uh, 
you know, traditions of native uh, literatures um, that have existed, you know, prior to this, uh, this country and, and continue to exist and thrive today. All right. Thank you, Nick. And last but of course not least, Jonathan, would you do the honors? Yeah, I'm Jonathan Bailey. Uh, I, this book isn't released yet, but this is about uh, ex-Mormon issues, LGBTQ issues, and uh, wilderness and how that tends to heal the other aspects of life in rural Utah. Um, my work is primarily as a conservation photographer, so I spend a lot of time in very remote areas, but this is an extension of what I usually do. All right. Wonderful. Well, thanks to all of you for those introductions. It's good to have a better sense of who you are, even though I know we're just scratching the surface. Um, given the theme of our panel today, the untold stories of the West, I'd like to start with exactly that question. And that is, in what way do you feel that your book is sharing some stories that have been untold or stories that perhaps complicate the popular understanding of the American West. And um, I think I'm gonna go through in about the same same order. So untold stories, how does your book fit into that theme? Kali, I'll have you go first. Thanks, well, I think it's a pretty complicated title, um, untold to whom. Um, my stories have been told and they've been told for generations and they were the stories that first formed my worldview. So I grew up in a large family of mixed Chicano people, of Filipino, my great grandfather from the Philippines, a grandmother who was Jewish. Um, and my great grandmother, her mother was um, Picaris Pueblo. And so our stories were very much told extensively within our communities. And I believe that publishing has really sort of uh, upheld certain kinds of stories that play into a certain sort of mythology that doesn't necessarily reflect many, many of our lives in the West and what we call the West, because essentially this is the center of my universe. Um, but Woman of Light, it follows Luz Lopez. She's a tea leaf reader in 1933 in Denver, and she's directly based on my Auntie Lucy, who migrated north from Southern Colorado in the 1920s. Her father was a Belgian miner who never married their mother and abandoned the family, and essentially left them for dead. Um, but they are survivors and they're incredibly powerful people that prevailed. And I wanted to merge my two interests, which were listening to these family stories, hearing these incredible stories and literature. I grew up reading books. I worked as a bookseller for over 15 years. My degrees are in literature, um, my MFA in creative writing. And I wanted to sort of merge those two interests and bring them together in my works. And both Sabrina and Karina and Woman of Light, um, I believe are doing that. All right, thank you, Kali. Sarah, a similar question to you. In what ways do you feel like you are telling perhaps untold stories? I think the stories I tell in my book are about a little known political party that started roughly a hundred years ago in North Dakota called the Nonpartisan League. And the Nonpartisan League believed that government should be in the hands of the people. And they believed that corporations should not be allowed to extract and exploit, extract wealth from the people and exploit them. And that government was there to benefit the people in very direct ways. And so they set up a state-owned bank. They set up a state mill and elevator, which are still in business 100 years today, even though North Dakota is a currently a red state. We also have a socialist bank and a socialist mill and elevator. And part of their work was in the 1930s when the times were so tough and the Great Depression and farms all over the country were going down. And the Nonpartisan League leaders had a created a, a suite of remedies amongst which were a foreclosure moratorium issued by gubernatorial proclamation. So these, this is the religion. I wouldn't even, in my family, it wasn't a political party, it was a religion. And I grew up hearing stories about the foreclosure moratorium and how it saved farmers. And so 
Um, I became a lawyer. I came back to North Dakota. I started working to, for farmers. And as these farmers came to me with stories of being pushed out of off, off their farms by an agency of the federal government that was supposed to be helping them, it was like everything kicked in for me. And I felt I had to help these farmers. I had to save them. So I, long story short, and it's, it is a bit of a long book, a lot of footnotes, um, but it does read well. But uh, <laughs> so I think that that definitely influenced me. And I think it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy I can tell the story of the Nonpartisan League because I think political people, politicians today should act more like the Nonpartisan League and protect the people, not the corporations. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And Nick, on to you, the, the untold stories. Yeah, so this book uh, begins in the context of the Standing Rock protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota, um, but it's really chronicling two centuries of Ocheti Shalkomi resist resistance to white incursion uh, into our territories. And so it, seem, it would seem like a familiar story, uh, I think, to people who live in North Dakota and South Dakota and in the West itself, you know, understanding things such as the Wounded Knee Massacre or like the, you know, the occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973 or more contemporarily the uh, Standing Rock protests. Um, but within that, there's kind of a, a parochialism in the sense that we are, we tend to be defined by the region itself and, and kind of thought of just as domestic subjects. But what I document in this book, uh, especially in the 20th century, is the profound internationalism of the Ocheti Shakome, going back to people such as Zinkala Shah, Gertrude Bonin, who uh, was a Yankton poet uh, and part of our literary tradition, who you know was boarding school educated, but nonetheless understood the importance of something like the League of Nations. And and indigenous people in North America's place there. And also, you know, figures such as Charles Eastman going to uh, the World Conf Congress on Races in 1911 with W.E.B. Du Bois as part of the Society of American Indians. You know, he, he himself running from the genocidal campaigns uh, known as the Columns of Vengeance coming out of uh, Minnesota and culminating in the massacre at Whitestone Hill in, in you know, um, in 1863 during the, this, the U.S. Civil War, um, it's, it's, a, it's a massacre that, you know, even the army itself doesn't really recognize and isn't, doesn't have the same kind of, uh, you know, um, recognition as like Sand Creek or Wounded Knee. But nonetheless, that's what I try to document in this history is to, sh to show the profound uh, presentism of this history and also the future-oriented project of indigenous existence that isn't fundamentally antagonistic to the people who live on the land, but shows, I think, much like um, Sarah and <laughs> Callie's book, an alternative uh, vision of, of what, you know, is what, you know, justice looks like amongst all people, uh, especially as it relates to the land and the water itself. All right. Thank you, Nick. And Jonathan, uh, what kind of untold stories are you sharing in your work? So the community where I grew up is about a thousand people and it's very, very not diverse. There's uh, like 90, oh, well over 90% is white, uh, over 80% is Mormon. Uh, and so you get this narrative of pioneer history and you get this narrative of Mormon history at large, but nobody has ever explained that there's actually a queer history happening in these very small communities in Utah. So, you know, growing up, even like well into my teens, I didn't even know that queer people existed. Um, and so my objective with uh, Red Clay was to introduce not only a queer history of the region, but also introduce that these are things that, you know, this environment uh, enhances the queer experience and that, you know, you have wilderness and you have an escape to this traditionally very rural, very conservative community. All right, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you all for 
for indulging us in, in that uh, untold stories question. I, I appreciate all of your answers. Um, because several of you brought up um, some of the importance of the land, and I think every single one of your books, and they're a diverse group of books. We have Collie's is a novel, Jonathan's is very much a memoir with a lot of uh, different essayistic descriptive passages. Um, Sarah and Nick, you're both historians, but with a very deep um, personal connection to what you're looking at and aspects of memoir and all of it. So we have, have a variety of things going on here, but one of the things I do think ties them together is the strength of the sense of place that comes through in the writing, regardless of whether it's fiction or nonfiction or something else, um, if there is a something else. And so I wondered if each of you could speak a little bit about in what ways is a connection to the landscape, uh, the philosophy of the sense of place important to the story that you're telling? And maybe to mix it up, I'm gonna jump ahead and start with Sarah this time and come around uh, and get to you all that way. So Sarah, what about the, the sense of place and the connection to the landscape is important in your work? Well, my book is mostly about farmers and ranchers who are deeply and inextricably connected to their land, sometimes multi-generational, but the, the one I would like to focus on is um, as I was developing the case and many farmers were coming to me and I was selecting people to be the North Dakota Nine. I still did not have a Native American farmer and rancher. And I thought if the federal government was discriminating against white, often Republican farmers and ranchers, they were treating Native Americans, no doubt, abysmally. And this was certainly the case. And so I put the word out that I wanted to have Native American, a Native American lead plaintiff. And I got a call from Lester Crowshart of the Fort Berthold Nation. And Lester hadn't just been on his land for generations. And he, he, his people had been on the bottom lands of the Missouri River for thousands, probably thousands of years. And and they, I put in a lot about how their land was flooded um, by the uh, Garrison Dam. And, um, but still, they were farmers and ranchers and they were sticking to it. And I remember Lester saying, and by that point, they had come and seized his cattle, his machinery, um, everything he owned, probably um, all the means of farming, but he said, they cannot have my land. And so he was he was the lead plaintiff and a, he and Sharon Crowshart were lead plaintiffs and they still have their land. And I, and then this led me to be volunteering to be one of the lawyers on a big discrimination case filed in 1999 that I worked on for close to 20 years called Keep Siegel versus Vilsack. And that dealt with discrimination by the same agency against all Native Americans all over the country. And we ended up getting a ton of money and a lot of claims were paid and a lot of debt was forgiven. And the leftover money founded the Native American Agriculture Fund, which is out doing fabulous work these days. So I'm, I'm just really happy that that, um, that story can be told um, because Native Americans were farmers and ranchers long before the settlement period. All right, well, thank you, Sarah. And that actually probably segues pretty nicely into uh, what some of Nick can talk about in terms of sense of place, although much broader as well. But an entire chapter of your book is devoted to the damming of the Missouri River and the damage that caused. But just in general, the, the connection to landscape and the philosophy behind that is, is a really central part of your book. Yeah, I think um, just to kind of speak to the, the question of dams, I mean, the Army Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. um, was the kind of overarching agency in charge of doing the environmental impact 
you know, uh, surveys for the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and in fact, the original route went upriver from Bismarck, um, but then the, the environment or the, the Army Corps of Engineers rerouted it to protect uh, a wetlands, but also uh, this high concentration of residential area uh, and rerouted it down river to, so then it would disproportionately impact the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. Um, that says several things. One, that the Army Corps of Engineers was interested in protecting the environment. Uh, and two, that they had they did a calculation of of impact and and deciding that um, because Bismarck didn't want it above their river, you know, above their city, that they were going to move it down river. Well, that's just the history of the Army Corps of Engineers and its philosophy towards um, indigenous people in the Missouri River Basin in general. That we, you know, if you look at a map and you look at where all the major dams are on the river it's all on Indian reservations and disproportionately impacting and flooding, flooding Indian reservations. Uh, and to kind of give you an idea of, of how this, you know, plays into this, this question of our uh, relationship to the land. One of the things that the Army Corps of Engineers did, uh, in, you know, in, in conjunction with the Bureau of Indian Affairs is they did these massive surveys of land, much like what um, Sarah was talking about in terms of calculating how much uh, you know the cattle enterprise uh, would be would be destroyed? I think there's a tendency to think of native people as kind of existing outside of history, and like you know we were farmers and ranchers even you know prior to uh, colonization and even during colonization. And in fact, the Missouri River tribes became expert ranchers, you know, and it became uh, not a lucrative business but a, a subsisting business, a way that we made our lives as well as, you know, uh, subsisting off of the land itself in terms of, you know, still getting what, what, what they termed the wild fruits of nature, such as, uh, you know, wild plums, um, harvesting game, wildlife, harvesting, you know, what they called things like such as mouse beans. Well, um, when the Army Corps of Engineers came in, they calculated that those dams would destroy 75% of the game, the wild game, it would disappear because of lack, lack of access, to uh, shelter lands in the bottom lands because it's the plains that's only where only place where trees grow um, and it would also destroy our cattle economy and our small agricultural economy it destroyed 90 percent of our commercial timber as well so this took us from a, a state of you know it's not to glorify the reservation period at all but at least we were subsistent and it took us from a state of subsistence to a a state of complete dependence in, in, one, in the 20th century. This wasn't a, a 19th century kind of thing. Um, and you saw diabetes skyrocket on the reservation. Prior to that, it was relatively unknown. So you have the forced change of diet, but also the forced dislocation of our connection to this particular landscape. Um, and I think the phrase mini wichoni, you know, it says, it says a lot about this idea that water is our first medicine because we're all born in water. It's actually in one of our constellations. It's called Tamini, which means her water or their water, which is the our Lakota word for placenta. Um, and that's, you know, that's where our kind of esoteric, uh, you know, I, one could call it spiritual knowledge comes from. Uh, and it, I don't want to like essentialize that viewpoint because at the end of the day, the argument that we were making and still make to this day is that we all drink water. You know, it's not like we we have some kind of special, unique power to drink more water in a, in a different way. We all drink water, and it sustains the livelihoods and the economies uh, on the northern plains. And so that's that's really the question that we've we've been putting forward. And it's not without you know a special you know history or whatever, but it's also to look back and say like in the 1980s farmers and ranchers allied with Lakota and Dakota people over uranium and coal mining in the Black Hills region, because we all understood that treaty rights were protecting, um, uh, you know, workers' rights uh, to a healthy environment, as well as, you know, uh, ranchers and farmers who needed uh, groundwater and, you know, clean river water. So when we talk about Mini Wichoni and the treaty rights, it's something I think people think of as as an Indian problem, but actually it's everyone's problem. It's like your government made these treaties with us and it's your obligation to uphold that law as well. Okay, thank you, Nick. And 
Jonathan, uh, the question of connection to landscape, sense of place, that has obviously been such an important part of your work outside of this forthcoming book. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I grew up in an area that was millions of acres of land that was virtually unexplored to the federal government, only 10% of which is formally recorded. Uh, so it was incredibly, I was incredibly privileged to see this landscape that, you know, you can find new species and new, uh, you know, plants and animals and springs and water sources and all of these amazing things that to this day remain unrecorded. Um, but for me, uh, it was always very important that there was this space outside of the eyes of the community, that there is this, you know, you can't so much as like buy medicine at a store without like the entire town knowing about it. So like in, in terms of queer history, this it's so important to have, you know, an eyeless space that you can just be yourself and you can, you know, hike and enjoy animals and, and see all of these things that many people haven't seen for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Um, but, you know, I think that nature in general has the potential to teach all of us about, you know, kindness in terms to ourselves and to other people in our community, because, uh, you know, it, it shows the priorities of, of being with the being with yourself, being with your emotions, and just realizing that like work and schooling and all of these things that are important, but aren't necessarily what we take to us when we die. So like, you know, the, the last moment we have is, is the moment we spend remembering all the wonder we've had with the universe. So that's what I'd say. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Jonathan. And Kali, the sense of place, the connection to landscape, also very important in your work. Yeah, so I, I like to think of myself as a placed person uh, without the patterns of migration and labor that essentially built the West in the way that we know it. A, a human being like me cannot exist. So the layers upon layers of my ancestry is because of the natural landscape, beginning with my indigenous ancestors. And then you have new waves of people coming in, miners, um, field farm workers. Um, so in Woman of Light, the reason I'm exploring two different time periods, the 1890s and the 1930s, is because I really wanted to look at the moment my ancestors ancestors came from a rural west and entered into the city and how the impacts of the city really changed them. Uh, one of the scenes that I'm thinking of in the novel that really sort of exemplifies this idea of land and how that imprints itself on the psyche, Luce um, is remembering when she's an eight-year-old girl and she's first come to the city with her brother, Diego, and their, um, their Auntie Maria Josie. She's a butch lesbian. She's a queer matriarch of this novel. She's based on my actual auntie. Um, Maria Josie is telling them, it's really important that you learn the map, so to speak. You need to understand the city as if it were the back of your hand because these people will try to harm you. There's Ku Klux Klan picnics, there's car races, there's cross burnings, and there's lynch mobs. And these are actual threats of violence that will harm you. So you need to learn your way around the city as if it were the land. Um, and so Luz and Diego, they're, they're going through Denver, it's the 1920s, and they think they've arrived in a safe neighborhood. It's sort of a mixed neighborhood. There's black owned stores, there's Greek owned stores. And suddenly a man drives by and rolls down his window in a truck and he tells them to go back to their own country and he spits on loose. And in that moment, I, I remember thinking like when I wrote the scene, you know, like Luce is of this country. This country created a character like Luce. This country created characters like everyone in this novel. Um, but we're constantly told that we don't belong here. We don't have a space here. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I think the, the way that I'm exploring land in my work is I want to point the eye 
to labor history, to the history of colonization, to the ways that this has been layered and a lived experience of the people who are on top of the land, not necessarily um, looking at the mountains and thinking they're so beautiful, let me write a long, gorgeous passage about the beauty of the mountains, which I do, I love doing that. Uh, but there's always sort of a deeper purpose um, when I'm engaging with the land in my work. That's great. Thank you all for, for talking about that. Um, different landscapes, certainly for all of you, but uh, very important in all ways. Um, I'm going to move to a question that, that has maybe a little bit more to do with, the, with just the creation of, of the books we're talking about. Um, and that is just what kind of things can you tell us about the research and writing process for this book? And in some cases, maybe it's more research and less inspiration, or in some cases, maybe it's more inspiration, less research, but, but talk a little bit about that progress process. Where did it start? And what kinds of sources did you call on? And I think Nick, this time I'll start with you. So this book uh, actually began 10 years ago before uh, Standing Rock happened in 2016. Um, and, and it became a, sort of a process of me trying to just understand why, um, you know, the river was flooded. And it was, you know, like this whole idea that we think of like a term like settler colonialism and they value indigenous land to turn it into production, to work it, to, you know, make profit. But they also ind value indigenous land because it can be destroyed. Um, and we are sacrifice, you know, we're the sacrifice of that. And so even in the destruction of our land, it has value. And this tied into all kinds of things, such as, you know, my, my family's history in boarding school. I'm only one generation removed. You know, um, my dad went to one of the most uh, notorious boarding schools in our area. And, you know, where like rampant reports of, you know, violence and abuse happened. And so it actually began with me trying to figure out why, you know, the, those histories um, became the way that they did and the history of the town that I grew up in, in Chamberlain. So um, that's really where it became like a family conversational history. And I started doing oral histories when I was in um, uh, my master's program at the University of South Dakota and really dived into uh, archive research um, in like 2006, 2008. And it was all just kind of sitting there. Uh, so to speak. And then I, I had this fellowship when I was in, um, in 2016 in Chicago, and I just got back from the Standing Rock camps. And I was like, what am I doing? I'm writing this research project. And so I abandoned my dissertation uh, at that time. And I just went back to Standing Rock. And I was like, I'm going to write this book, uh, because otherwise, you know, it, I don't know how it's going to get written. So it's a, it's a mix of like, interviews that I've done uh, on the ground. Um, you know, my own participation uh, in the protests themselves, but also um, really not doing anything new. And I think that there's a sense of, you know, in this generation that we have to do something novel, that we have to constantly innovate. But really what I was doing, and I talk about that, it's, you know, part of the title, The Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance. It's, it, I'm drawing upon, you know, a tradition, a literary tradition, and a, and a tradition of storytelling. And I'm not really creating anything new. I'm just I'm just retelling those stories from the people who've already, you know, lived those things. And so um, that's really what I was trying to do is build kind of on a tradition, mixing oral histories, participant observation, archival research, um, as well as this, this broader kind of literary tradition. And the, the motivation for writing it actually came from, you know, writing to my high school self, uh, my 16 year old self who needed a book like this, um, going to Chamberlain High School, not even knowing that native people wrote books. Um, so that's really my inspiration, the audience and the person that I was writing to uh, when I wrote this book. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, Jonathan, we'll, we'll go to you next with the same question, the inspiration and the sources um, for this book. So when I was Red Clay was definitely started during the pandemic. I was in this really small apartment that was very difficult to leave during this time period because of just the design of the, the apartment complex. So I was not getting out in the wild. I was not exploring myself creatively. And I think that led first to literature um, because I've written a lot in the past, although my primary uh, creative outlet is photography. 
Um, and it also made me contend with feelings that I haven't really had to deal with because I'm so often, you know, on the road and working that I don't frequently have to think about my past, don't have frequently have to think about my Mormon upbringing. So I started writing this and then, you know, I wanted it to not only be authentic to my current experience, but also be authentic to my past experience. So I started going through like high school journals, notebooks, started going through old family videos. There's like seven hours of family videos that I was spanning through trying to make sure I captured who I was at the time also. So it was a very broad uh, quarantine project, you could say. Oh, great. Well, it worked out well then. It was a very, very useful quarantine for you. <laughs> so, Kali, how about you? Um, the the res resources, the inspiration, the research, how did you combine all that? Of course. So a lot of my inspiration comes from the literature that I was reading as a teenager. Um, it was over a decade ago that I decided that I wanted to write Woman of Light. And I wanted to offer Chicanos like me that come from these backgrounds that are incredibly complicated. I wanted a sort of origin story uh, because a lot of our histories had been wiped out of textbooks. Uh, we didn't really have an understanding of a communal story. A lot of the stories were dispersed um, into different groups under the umbrella term of Latinx. And I wanted something that was speaking more to the regional experience. Um, so I, I was really inspired by writers like Toni Morrison, especially Beloved, um, the amount of research that went into that novel and the amount of emotional truth. I'm thinking of writers like Catherine Ann Porter, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, which is set in Denver during the influenza pandemic in the 1920s. And just knowing that I could sort of wield this beautiful prose, this very lovely sounding language that almost mimicked the oral tradition of my elders, the way that they use pauses and silences and repetition, um, all those rhythms, I wanted to somehow capture that and put that into the literary form. Um, with this novel being set in the 1930s, there was an extensive amount of archival research that was done. And that really began before I wanted to be an author, I wanted to be an archivist. And I interned at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, DC and as an undergrad. And I remember just filing and filing records and being taught about the record, um, the cycle of termination that we are actually deleting records as a country, we're hiding things on purpose, we're destroying things. And it, it was one of the first times that I, I spoke to a records expert in the field of health who knew something about Colorado. Um, there was this incredible um, researcher from Africa and I, I, he said, you're from Denver. He said, have you ever heard of this neighborhood called Globeville? I said, yeah, that's where I did Sutiatro as a kid. I was in community theater there. And he said, there's cancer clusters all over that neighborhood because of the poison of radium and uranium that happened and the processing that happened in that community. I'm 21 years old, never knew this about my own community, about a place where I had spent my summers. And in Women of Light, there actually is radium mining. And I tie that all back to Marie Curie in Paris, discovering the element. And I, I just find research to be this unending curious web that fulfills my hunger for knowledge. And that is something also that came from my elders. Wonderful, yes, mixing very different kinds of knowledge as most of you are doing. So um, Sarah, that question as well. I think I saw something about how many boxes and boxes of files that you went through for something you also lived, but tell us a little bit about your research and your writing process. And make sure we get you unmuted first. Yes, um, the, the research was a real challenge. Um, I did not keep a diary or a journal during the years I was litigating and developing the case or really ever, but I am, and I was then a paper pack rat. I knew that what I was doing at the time was significant 
and I saved everything. I saved bills, I saved notes, I saved drafts, I saved copies of regulations. And so that was the, the base of the book. Um, and over the years, I was on, once, a, once I was on the verge of throwing them out, even though I knew it was the best collection about the 80s from depression, probably ever, and an art, a state archivist. And I think archiv archivists are heroes, heroic people. Um, anyway, this historian told me to call the archivist and the archivist zipped over, said, I'll take them. And um, so it ended up that there are now 99 boxes uh, of, of papers <laughs> from my work and so forth in, in North Dakota. Uh, and for this book, I think it was a, a part, parts of them, but it was hard to face, you know, because you kind of relive things as you go through that. So I, I had a lot of emotions to work through. Um, um, some of the people's files I found I couldn't help, which was still caused a lot of pain. Um, it was also hard to organize them because organize, my organizational system for papers was to sweep off the top of my desk every time I moved into boxes and then they were <laughs> just go someplace. So before I could write the book and the book is more or less chronological, um, I had to put them into chronological order and I had to index them. So that, that took years. And then another challenge I had is I had to get over my legal writing style. Legal writing style is, is totally different from any other kind of write, writing. And for example, lawyers in their legal writing never ever use the word I, never ever go into the first person unless they're in trouble. <laughs> and somebody's accusing them of malpractice or something, but though, the, I had to change that, which was pretty deeply set in me to be a legal writer. And then, um, anyway, it took a long time, probably planning to get out of law so that it could write took a full year. And then it was really seven years of dinging around with the papers and organizing and and then the Keep Siegel case took a lot of time in those years. And then finally, I, I spent close to three years writing and rewriting and drafting and leaving, cutting. And, um, and I, I had to leave a lot of stories out, but you can't, can't put everything into one book. <laughs> anyway, it was my first book. book. Um, maybe not my last, we'll see. That's the, that is wonderful. Hopefully you all have, have more work that, that will be coming. Um, let's see, we've got maybe about 15 minutes or so left to, to talk. So we'll get in one more question or maybe two if, if we can, can do that. But I'd like to ask you each to think about, um, first, what do you hope readers will take away from your book? Um, what kinds of effects would you like to have? And of course, as an author, you can't control that in any way, but perhaps you have hopes. And so Jonathan, I'll start with you. What, what would be your hope that readers would take away from your book? And you might think about, are there, do you wish different audiences would take different aspects of it? Right. Uh, for queer kids, I hope that they realize that there is a diverse experience to be had. Not only is it okay to be who you are, but it's also okay to not fall into any category that you're expected to fall into because i know especially in utah you're expected to be like stereotypical or extremely mormon <laughs> and the, the the reality is that you can be whoever you want to be um to mormon readers i hope that they find empathy for a lot of people um and just for the general reader i think i would hope that they realize that there is a lot of you know, experiences that are being had throughout this country in rural communities that they may not realize are happening in this day and age. They think we've made so much progress and we have, but there is also 
you know, these communities that exist in a bubble and they're, you know, many, many decades in the past in many ways. So I would hope that whoever comes into this book, they take out of it what they need most to, you know, lead to a, a diverse and happy community. All right, taking what they need most. That's, that's a wonderful thought. So Kali, how about you? What do you hope people take from your book? You know, with all of my work, I really want the outcast and all of us to feel more seen, to feel that they have a connection to characters. Because as a reader, that was one of the reasons I just plowed through book after book is because writers were sort of speaking to this hidden part of myself. Um, the things that I was ashamed of, the acts that I was embarrassed of, you know, suddenly you're reading uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and you realize, oh my God, I'm just like Atticus. Like, I also have these things within me. Um, and so with my works, I really want people to feel like somehow they're connecting across time and space with characters who are maybe just like them, because a lot of my readers do come from my own background, but I have readers all over the world now I have readers of Japan who write me and they tell me they really identify with these women and the violence and their communities and the trauma they've gone through. And to me, like that is the ultimate power of literature. Um, I was very careful with the wording of the dedication of Woman of Light. It's not dedicated to Denver, the state, capital S. It's dedicated to the people of Denver. And that's the heart of all of my work. I... I very much felt lonely through much of my life. I spent a lot of my time by myself reading books or writing books. And at the other end of this journey, I've now built a community and I'm continuing to build a community. And so really that I believe is the ultimate goal of all of my books is that I'm building something new that brings people in who feel like they have been pushed to the margins over and over and over again. And one of the most incredible things that I, I think is happening with my work is that for some people, this is their first experience learning about what we now know as Colorado. And before me, their, their experiences may have been like old Westerns and John Wayne movies. And now they're like, Collie Fajardo, Einstein's like mine. That's my first doorway into Colorado. And that's just something that like my family could have never have dreamed possible. Uh, so I just, I want to embrace more and more community with my work. Wonderful. Um, Sarah, same question for you. What do you hope people take away from, from your book? I, I, I think my main purpose is for people to appreciate family farmers more and understand the importance of family farmers to the environment, to the air, to our food, to our health, to our communities to small towns, to ethics, um, to a proper government, you know, like it all ties in. So that would be one thing. And by the way, a good way to support family farmers is to kick in money to farm aid. Willie Nelson's been at it since the, you know, for, since the eighties and he's true blue and the money is well spent. And uh, so that's, just a simple donation to Farm Aid, that would be one thing. And then another thing, um, I hope that the government never does anything like this again. And I'm happy now that I know this book is re becoming to be required reading at the USDA for people running these programs. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to go to meet with the externs of a federal judge um, because they want these young lawyers to to learn what a young lawyer could do you know and obviously i had a ton of help but i didn't know i would have help when i started the help came um and so those are some of the things uh, i i there's a, a law firm in, in Bismarck, the Broughton Law Firm that carries on the kind of work that I practiced before I dropped out to become a writer. And um, a, a young lawyer read the book and said, I wanna be, I wanna do law like that and called Derek. And so like, 
if I can influence young lawyers to, to do this kind of law, uh, to represent real people, um, that would be good too. And then let the, let the history, um, a lot of the history be known um, that, you know, that I think is, is kind of forgotten. Like there's a lot about the thirties and the program started by the FDR administration. I've already mentioned the nonpartisan league, history of native Americans and agriculture. Um, so, but it's a legal thriller. There you go, for sure. And a true story. All right, Nick, how about you? What would you say you would like readers to take away? And do you hope for different things from different audiences? Or is there one main message? Well, there was a report that came out last November that found that Native-led movements in Canada and the United States are currently challenging a quarter of carbon emissions from both Canada and the United States the largest per capita polluters and emitters um, in the world. So even though we're the minority of minority, we're punching way above our weight class in terms of challenging and protecting a, you know, a, a viable future on this planet and water and air that we all need to, uh, to breathe. So that's one um, aspect of it. Um, the other aspect is to look in really learn about the the names that are mentioned and the sources that I use. Um, you know, the there was a two-spirit camp in uh, the uh, Standing Rock camps, which is actually one of the leadership camps um, for LGBTQ and two-spirit uh, people who were uh, leading the, the protests. And, you know, when you Google Lakota people or, or Dakota people on the internet, oftentimes you find tintype photos of men of the 19th century, right? Um, and really, you know, the names such as Madonna Thunderhawk, Phyllis Young, uh, Candy Brings Plenty, LaDonna, you know, Brave Bull Allard, Deborah Whiteplume are the, are the people who were really leading the camps themselves. Um, uh, also, Faith Spotted Eagle, these are names that you should know. And these are people that you should do more research on and you should reach out to and invite to your colleges, your universities, your classrooms and learn from them. Um, and then also you should know that our, our literary tradition is very, you know, very, um, very long and very storied. Uh, my colleague, Sarah Hernandez, uh, found that the Ocheti Shakoi authors have, have published over 250 books, just titles um, by our nation alone. Um, so, you know, the Oak Lake, going back to the Oak Lake Writers Society, this book would not have been possible had it not been for people such as Elizabeth Cooklin, who is a Dakota writer, who was born and raised 20 miles north of where I was born and raised and experienced uh, much of the similar history as me, you know, um, of course, you know, separated by uh, like 60 years. <laughs> uh, but, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, same, same kind of tradition. And, and that's really what I, I, I think is most important. It's like people want a new kind of, you know, we want the new native author. And it's like, well, there isn't just one of us. It's we're, you know, we're a chorus of people. We're so diverse. We're, we're actually more the diverse than the nations that colonized us uh, in terms of our linguistic diversity, our cultural, spiritual, and religious and political diversity. And I think that's a testament to the kind of world that we're trying to build and the society that we're trying to build, you know, a world in which many worlds fit because that's what sovereignty was about for us. It was about recognizing the strength and difference, not in the strength and uniformity or hegemony. So that's one thing that I, I really want to kind of get across is just the, the diversity of our stories and who we are as Ocheti Shaokoi, as the original people of this land, but also the fact that it's not just you know, our, our history in, in, in a singular sense, it's many histories and many different people. And I just really hope that this book you know, you pick this book up and it opens doors for you uh, to, to do more research and to, to understand, you know, that not only is my book the only book, you know, it's, there's other books out there and there's other voices out there. And I'm just, you know, one, as Elizabeth Cookland told me, she said, you don't even own your own life. You're just here to ensure the coming of the next generation. And I think that's really um, the philosophy that I've, I've had in, in terms of writing this book. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Yes, thank you all. I like that you refer to to this as uh, not just one voice, but a chorus, because I think you're all a bit of a chorus today uh, with lots of diverse viewpoints and, and different ideas. Uh, well, we are coming to the end of our time, and I just want to thank you all again so much for being with us today. Um, thank you for sharing your work with the world and with the Great Reads from Great Places list uh, through the Library of Congress. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, this is a testament to the richness and diversity of this nation's literary creativity, and I think it really is, and I think you have proved it today. So to Kali, Sarah, Nick, Jonathan, thank you for sharing your words, and thank you for sharing your time today, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Thank you.